able to find um, maybe a perspective or consider a perspective in which you'll be able to apply that to your online discussion boards. I have to admit at the, at the beginning, I'm a theory girl. I love theories. Um, I, I do think they help to shape the way that we can approach things. So there are a couple of theoretical frameworks that we'll talk about um, this morning. And then the second objective that I hope you're able to do by the end of the session is to generate some strategies. I'm going to give you some, but maybe those you can take and modify. Um, some people, they like seeing what I have been doing because they feel validated and that's fine. And then here's the beauty. I've learned from them and then I'm taking their ideas and applying it or, or morphing it into somehow with, with what I do. And that's really what we should be doing in education anyway. But hopefully to take some kind of strategy or to generate one that you can use to guide, monitor, and even assess um, online discussion boards. Um, I also have examples. I've taken screenshots, but I'm, I'm able, now that I know I can um, do a share screen, I'm able to go into one of my courses if necessary, and if we have time at the end, and I am watching the time on my phone, um, and I'm happy to walk you through also what it is that I do. And we do use Canvas um, as our LMS at Murray State. Okay. All right, so we are gonna go into a breakout first um, because I am interested in knowing the concerns you have about online discussions, okay? We know that online discussions are just integral to online learning, but there are some concerns. So there are two tasks that you have in your breakout session. Um, this is where I'm sure everybody in their small groups is going to have a concern. It's so great. Share that. Um, I'm going to give, it's um, 1041 my time. So I'm going to give everyone about eight to 10 minutes in your groups to explain those concerns to one another. You might find that your group has a primary concern. If so, great. When we come back into um, the main session, then what I want you to do is enter in the chat box. Um, what was that primary concern or concerns, maybe there's two or three, that you feel um, needs to be, you know, warranted to, you know, that we can really talk about. I also want to see these to make sure that, um, you, you know, that pretty much I do have some strategies as well. And I'm able just to kind of, um, just kind of roll things along as, as necessary. So I'm just curious, I just want to get the conversation started about what concerns us regarding online discussions. So um, Dr. Elkins, um, however you need to break them out, and it doesn't matter to me about the number of rooms, whatever you feel is, is, um, is comfortable. Okay, how long would you like to have the session be? Um, I would say, um, let's, let's go with eight minutes. I think eight minutes will be good. Okay, and so those of you who will be going into rooms, um, you'll start to get a countdown at 60 seconds at a minute that you'll be moved back into the the main room you may have to click to agree to join um, but i think you'll be moved automatically and um, dr schimberger unfortunately i have not been able to figure out yet how to keep you from moving into a room <laughs> so <laughs> you may go into a room as well <laughs> no problem um, but um i will make that happen right now and then i will see you all back here in about eight minutes discussions. Yeah, grading strategy. We talked a lot about that in my group. Yes, absolutely. Um, do we read the entire threaded discussion? Um, what do we do about that? Um, general, let's see, one, one concern was the effectiveness of students responding to two. Yeah, how effective is that? Um, there's, um, that's debatable. I will say that up front, but we will talk about that too. 
um, a general anxiety about discussions when things are recorded. Yes, absolutely. Um, how to gauge quality and learning in async discussion forms when grading or evaluating. Yeah, uh, after the fact. Um, um, yeah, thank you, Kurt, for putting that in there, especially when you've had a lag time, um, you know, two or four days later. What do you, what do, you do about that? Um, discussion is a misnomer. It's really a form of texting um, that removes the immediacy of verbal exchange that includes paratextual cues. We'll talk some about that too, um, because I've, I've done this a couple of ways. It's not always been text. Um, I think this is an opportunity to explore some um, ed tech tools that, that could also be used for effective discussions. Yeah, and how do we get students to continue conversations when using static post and discussion boards? Should the instructor participate in an online conversation? Pop into the breakout groups and synchronous sessions. Lots of great concerns here. And they are good concerns because they're going to keep us thinking, keep us moving. And one of the things that I think synthesizes all of this well, and this was brought up in our group, one of the first points made um, is, you know, when you're in your physical classroom, and you're able, and if you do have students working in small groups, I mean, even though we're in a pandemic, you, you can still do some in-class small group discussions, just six feet apart, but it's easy to see the energy ongoing. It's easy to see what is taking place and hearing the conversations, because then you can walk around the room. I think Stacy mentioned that in our small group. Um, you're able to, to do all that. You can monitor it better, right? And I think sometimes when we um, go to online, it becomes a, a different story. Um, but class discussions are really great for us. We love class discussions because they, they do what? They help the art students to connect with the material. And they connect with the material through ways that are with each other and hopefully with you too, but you know, at least we want them to connect to the material, right? That's really important. Um, I, th I do believe this is where learning communities get established in, in class discussions. Um, a lot of these might take place outside of class. Maybe they're able to form some um, study groups. That's great. Um, I knew of one instructor, oh gosh, this is probably three or four years ago, who was able to see um, how a particular um, topic in, in his class, the students really um, gravitated toward that even more so to the point where they actually established like a learning community and, and did some things with it throughout the semester, which I thought, wow, that's, that's fantastic. You know, so we, we do know the value of class discussions. There was also concern that I saw in that chat, you know, that students might not take classroom discussions seriously, um, or at least, you know, any kind of discussions. Um, and they, they do with class, but I think sometimes what happens with online is this, what I call plop in front of the screen syndrome, um, where we put a discussion assignment in the LMS and it's just something for them to do. It creates what I think even in our small group that Kurt had mentioned, it becomes this busy work problem. And that's something that we don't want to do. If students complain about this being busy work, and they have, um, the pandemic has really brought that quite a bit to light. And I don't know if some of you have really kept on, there was a good online discussion um, on Twitter about this. Um, it was from an associate provost at another university, I can't remember where it was, but he had received calls from, from parents um, and had heard complaints from students about all the busy work that was going on with these online classes, what was going on. And it wasn't that it was really online busy work. What it was is this is what we're used to doing in class, classroom discussions. And now that everything had moved to online, we're trying to replicate that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but students were seeing this as busy work because now they're having to enter text or they're having to create maybe a video response or an audio response. And so they weren't seeing the value. There was still that disconnect, even though we're connected online. So there was some sort of um, just, a, I guess, just kind of a polar perspective to online discussions. The thing is, is though, 
in an LMS, especially when you have moved your education to virtual, the discussion becomes the heart of what it is that we're trying to do, which is help students make those connections to the content. They are still our primary tools to facilitate discussions, but I think we have to think outside the box of really what an online discussion can look like. Engaging in this online platform is challenging um, for a number of reasons. To give you an example, and I thought how timely of an example, it was horrible, but it was very timely. It occurred to me yesterday. Um, I had a student, we had done a think pair share in Canvas. And unfortunately, one of the other students, so her other, her partner had plagiarized her response. And I'm like, great, now I have to deal with this. So no matter what we try to do, there's still always going to be a challenge. Um, so some of the strategies that I will share with you and that I hope that we can all share together if um, like if time allows even after we are finished with the presentation that you'll be able to to see, you know, we can do all these great things, but there's still going to be a challenge and that's okay. Okay, because we are problem solvers. We can figure this out. So those are the things that what we're seeing with online discussion boards, these um, this dichotomy, if you will. There are a couple of theoretical perspectives that I rely on when I'm trying to design, I guess, not really that perfect discussion, but just an effective discussion. I always think, you know, what is it that I'm really wanting them to do? Yes, I want them to connect to the content. So there's that learner content interaction that I think is, to me, it's crucial. I definitely want them to interact with one another. That way they're feeling like they are in a classroom. They do interact with me somewhat. I, I have a different philosophy about my presence in the discussion boards. I will go ahead and admit that I don't participate in the discussions, but I do let students know that I see them, okay? And I do, I, I check in about once a day with them to see what's going on, how the discussion is going, and also to make sure that everybody's being nice, you know, that we're playing in the sandbox well. That is, that is important for us to still do. Um, so I use that a lot. And then there's another perspective that came from this. It's very similar. Um, you know, when we connect our learners to the content, there's that cognition dimension that we're meeting. And that is crucial um, because that's how we're measured, right? Um, when it comes down to all the metrics as far as are we retaining students because do they know things? Are we graduating students because they know things? So that cognitive presence is really key teaching presence. Um, so again, that learner to instructor um, interaction. That social presence is sometimes though what I want students to do more in a discussion post. I really want them to connect. Um, obviously, I do want them to connect with me, but to me it's that cognitive and then that social presence. So how is it that a student identifies with his or her peers in class? You know, whether their contributions are meaningful, how can we help students make discussions meaningful? We'll talk about those things too. And then how, um, let me minimize my screen so I can see it. And then how student fosters peer relationships um, to build that collaboration and support that discourse. Because sometimes we're talking about how when they respond, um, some of their responses might be a little trite. Um, so how do we make them, or not make them, but how do we encourage students to really um, have these well fleshed out thoughts and arguments, okay? It is an opportunity for growth. So I will say that it's taken me a while, but I think students have become better overall in online discussions. This is me anecdotally. Um, that's been my observation in the last several years that I've been teaching online. So those are the two big um, theoretical frameworks that I try to really use and think about when I'm just designing um, my online discussion um, assignments for my courses. Here's the important tip that before we go into the strategies, this is the big one. And this is what I always, whenever I'm doing anything in faculty development, always make sure to remind um, our instructors, what is it you want students to do? What are those learning objectives? If your learning objectives don't call for students to really discuss anything, then maybe there is no need for a discussion board assignment, okay? Um, maybe it is more of individual work. Maybe you need them to apply in different ways. 
Um, but you know, sometimes we can also use discussions where we can actually share maybe work. Maybe they can post a video file that um, reflects a research paper. Um, maybe they can talk about it. Um, I don't know. It depends on what your learning objectives are. So if you're needing students to discuss or describe or explain or tell, then yeah, discussion boards would be great. Um, but if it's not in that module or the unit to discuss or any of those, um, those key cognitive Bloom's taxonomy verbs, then maybe we need to rethink another assessment tool. So that's something that I always caution first before we go into anything, anything else. So here are some strategies that I have. So one, I think it's really key that in the prompt, you know, what the question is, or maybe there's a statement or whatever your prompt is, but that you do provide some guidelines and stipulations. What is it, and I do this in the form of, of a task. So you kind of saw on that screen before you went to your breakout room where I had a tasks and those two things. I, I do that and I'll show you again examples. I just wanna go through the strategies first, but then I'll show you examples of how I structure um, those discussion board assignments in Canvas. Those action verbs are key. Students do better when they see, I've got to do this or I've got to do that. It becomes kind of like a checklist, but if it gets them in that direction, we're making progress. So make sure everything is stipulated as to really what it is you want them to do in the discussion board assignment. You need to structure the participation that's going to work for you. And what I mean by that, not just thinking about students, but also thinking about you, that brings us back to the one comment about, do I participate? Do I, what do I do? If you don't wanna participate, that's fine. But let your students know that. And I, I do let my students, they, they know that I do not really respond in the post itself. I give them feedback in the, the personal when I'm grading, but when it comes to actually being a part of the discussion, no, I want that to be their time. And then when I see their responses when I'm grading, then we kind of go into a more, I share with them some of my observations, what they did well, what they could work on, et cetera. But you need a structure that's gonna work for you. If you do wanna participate, then let them know that maybe you'll check in on the uh, uh, maybe two days after um, and that tells them that they'll need to go back in there and respond to any questions that you might have asked in, in that discussion response. But make it work for you. And, and this kind of brings it back here. So if you do decide to participate, let students know when you will. Um, and I think that kind of helps because students might be like, oh, I need to hurry up and get in there and work on this before, you know, Dr. S, you know, gets in there. And I've had that happen before when I used to participate in them. Um, and then many times too, even though they know I'm not going to, to actively be a part of the discussion, they know I'm watching. And so they, they are aware that I do watch um, for any problems that might arise. If the discussion veers off or something like that, then I send that, that message to the student. I like to praise in public, but you know, if I need to criticize in a healthy way or, or send them some concerns, then I do that privately. Vary the tech methods of response. So one of the concerns um, noted in the chat is a valid concern. It's about the text, you know, as far as writing all the time. Is it possible that students could do a video response? Um, what about um, maybe an audio? Would it be possible to move the discussion out of Canvas into another platform, maybe Twitter. Maybe if you set up a hashtag, I'm probably getting way off for some of you, but you know, just think outside the box a little bit. I don't do this all the time, I do it for special things, but one of the modules in a course that I'm teaching this semester, uh, Sports Media, there's a research paper module. And I have it scaffolded because I've learned that students don't always know how to do research papers. Um, and they need that, that guidance. One of the ways that we're doing that is through VoiceThread. And VoiceThread, and I can show you that as well, but basically it allows them to interact via video, audio, or text, but I'm requiring them to do a video or audio response. Um, and it just gives them an opportunity to work through another tech tool, but it's still supporting my learning objectives for that module, okay? So consider that. Maybe if you, you might get, be getting tired of discussion boards as well. 
I do require that students respond to others because then that peer to peer interaction is going to grow. And I do include it in the rubric or if I sometimes I do forget to include it as a criterion. And if I don't include it, then I let students know um, I might take off a point or two or whatever. Um, I also tell students um, because of the way I, I structure the discussions, my discussions are designed as low stakes points. Um, they have them every week, but they're designed as low stakes. Um, and they have to respond to at least one other post. And I've given them examples as to make sure your, your post responds, your comment to your peer looks something like this. Don't be trite. Don't just say I agree and be done with it. Don't just give a one sentence statement. It needs to add to what you just read from your peer. Ask a question. Um, see it from a different perspective. Um, politely be that devil's advocate. You know, you can definitely do that too. So, you know, really require them to, you know, just try it and, and require them to respond. And, but if you're going to do that, give them something to kind of model. Direct traffic. So if you notice that we're getting off course here, then that might be when you, 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 you could step in, um, especially in, you can, you can do this a number of ways. You can, you know, put it in the discussion board. Maybe you can, you know, redirect it back so that, so that way you're addressing another question that's related. Um, if you want to send a message to the student to allow them an opportunity to edit maybe their response, you know, so there are some opportunities, however you wish to do that. And I mentioned this earlier, but I do inform students privately when they maybe haven't really responded to the discussion well, maybe I see their response and I'm like, that's, that really has nothing to do with what that student wrote or even it doesn't have anything to do with my question. So um, I do try to give them a second chance opportunity. Have students lead discussions, have them be guest moderators. Um, there's a course I'm taking at the University of Kentucky. It's interpersonal communication and instruction. And that's what we have to do. I, I actually moderate a discussion board next week. Um, and this is the first week that she started doing this. It's Dr. Frisbee and she's wonderful. Um, and I think that's a great opportunity. And the way that works, um, we had to submit questions in advance so that way she could go ahead and post them and, and uh, kind of choose the two that, well, she allowed us to pick the two that we wanted. And then she had two more as backups because then what she does every Wednesday morning um, for those who can attend, they'll do like um, synchronous discussions. Um, and that way she'll have some questions to kind of help guide those conversations. So, you know, that's a possibility. Students love it. I did it one time too um, in one of my courses and, you know, they're really good at it. So, you know, that could be an opportunity and something fun um, to break up um, maybe any monotony that might be going on with the discussions. Divide the class into small groups. Um, groups function in Canvas is helpful for that. Um, just recently, my um, students in my sports media did a think pair share, and that was really effective. Um, we really enjoyed that. Um, so that could be an opportunity. That way, they're just not seeing this long, you know, thread of, of posts and comments. They're just interacting one on one or three and four, however you wish to structure your small groups. So this is a screenshot of an example. And like I said, I can do a stop share and then go directly into my course if I need to. But what I do is, um, and this was the think pair share that I was just talking about in sports media, they looked at the cultivation theory um, in, in determining how uh, basketball, football, and baseball are perceived socially in media. So I give them a purpose. Why are they doing this discussion board assignment? It maps back to the module learning objectives um, and then the task. So you'll see how I have um, basically it's steps that they had to do first on their own. So they had to complete steps one through four individually and then record the responses in the discussion. Um, and then um, their partners, they'll discuss each other's responses in step five. So that gives them a breakdown of what they are to do as well as the deadlines. 
for both posting the initial response as well as um, replying to their partner's comments. Their criteria for success, they're going to get full points if the above uh, instructions are followed. Um, and I think that makes the grading easier for me. Now, when I'm reviewing responses, I, I do read them, but I, I'm just a, a kind of a quick reader and I do skim a little bit. And it's through that skimming that that's when I can tell, do I need to read some more? Um, and believe it or not, that's also how I've been able to catch other errors, like maybe whether it's some slight plagiarism or, or something like that. If I'm just like, that looks too familiar from what I just read three you know, minutes ago. Um, so I'm able to do those types of checks. So that's one way, and this was done using the groups function in Canvas. Here's another um, discussion in which I integrate the research module and talk that I spoke of earlier, um, in which students have to use VoiceThread to talk about their research ideas. Um, so again, it's separating to the purpose um, and the task, and then I embed in there the voice thread that they'll have to go in and actually leave a video or audio response. And again, if they do this, um, they'll receive the full points. I, I do about 10 points uh, on, on weekly discussion boards. And this is my graduate course that I do in which um, they have to write plan, well, plan, then write a research agenda in public relations. Um, and what they'll actually be doing, they're going to be doing it differently than what you see here. This was, I think, from last semester, and I've kind of modified this assignment now, where they'll post their research agenda, and then I'll peer review, I'll, I'll, I'll assign them a peer review to do in discussion. Um, so, you know, that's, that's also a possibility that you could do with, with students. Um, again, if you find that it, it maps to your learning objectives, if it's going to meet the purpose, um, it, and maybe even the, um, the level of the course might have some, um, some factor into your decision. So, um, we've kind of gone through some. I don't know if some of those might have helped. Um, I'm curious to know what strategy might you try. So if there was something that you're like, I'm going to do that, um, feel free to put in the chat or unmute. Or if there's something that you're like, I can do that, but this is how I do it differently. I'd like to hear that too. So if there's anything, let me open up the chat box um, just to see. Okay, should the instructor, I'm looking at some of these questions too, um, and they may have been a rollover from the previous assignment, let's see. Okay, so um, Donna often uses small groups but had not thought about doing partners before, expecting more in-depth communication between those partners. Um, with the groups function in Canvas once assigned, do they stay the same group for the duration of the course or can, yes, no, just, it's just for that assignment. So it's not for the duration. Now, one of the things the students can do is they can go back, there's like a tab um, and, and they can go back and, and kind of uh, go back and forth between groups. So you decide when you want to end the group. If, you, if it's just for that assignment, um, and you don't want them to see that group again, then you can undo the group. But it's just for that assignment, so it's not throughout the entire course. Um, yes, and let's see, criteria for success info, including what they will, yes, that, that has helped me, and I think it helps students too. Students wanna know how they're gonna be evaluated, and I think that's, that's fair, that promotes transparency. Um, the, yeah, the idea of having a student lead the discussion, good, good. Set up learning teams for an entire session in the fall. Okay, yeah. Um, it, and a lot of these are gonna have mixed results. Um, and although I, I will say, I think everything starts out great in the beginning of a the semester, then you know things start to trail, but right now uh, it's really effective. Um, yes, uh, thank you, um, Donna, for mentioning this too with the voice thread. Yeah. You, if you do a voice thread, and that's just that that's the problem with ed tech tools. They're wonderful to use, but some of them have um, fees or licenses, or you can get so many free, you know, whatever, and then you might have to pay. 
VoiceThread, um, if I remember right, you, you can receive, I think, five free, three or five, I don't remember. And then for a bundle of like four or five, it's like $5 every time. Um, or an annual license, I think, I think it's a hundred if I remember right. It just de depends. I don't use it that often. I just use it for special things. So I'm, I'm always used to just buying another three to four of those for five bucks is what I do. Does VoiceThread organize the responses in a thread? Um, they are threaded, but it's in VoiceThread. So it doesn't integrate over into Canvas in that regard but you can embed it in Canvas. I don't know if that, if that helps, but um, in fact, if you'd like, um, and then I mean, she wanted to know how often you use discussion boards per term and how many discussion boards are too many. Every week in all of my courses, pretty much, there is a module. Um, and I'm happy, let me do a stop share and let me get out of my presentation for a minute. And let me bring up, here we go. Um, let me go into my sports media class just so you can see, and I'll do another screen share. Just remember that. Here we go. Okay. So we're in my sports media course. This is the home page. Let me go into modules. Okay. Um, I, this course is set up a little differently from my other courses. I follow a methodology that Canvas also, that they created recently. Um, it's called Panda, uh, prepare, activate, navigate, demonstrate, and articulate. The discussions I serve, uh, with the demonstrate, uh, I want them to demonstrate to me, um, that they can basically discuss these things, whatever it might be, or explain, or tell, or describe, um, or share, what, whatever that, that is. They demonstrate that to me first in a low stakes opportunity, and then articulate, this is an individual assignment where I'm asking them possibly to go back into their discussions and review and, and, and go further on something, or it can be, be something different, it just depends. Um, so, one, let me see, let me get back to that question just so I can see exactly. Um, so how often they're used per, so every, every module pretty much has a discussion. Um, this is an asynchronous course um, and the modules are released every Sunday night and then they've got work to do through the week. I have discussions due usually on a Saturday, late Saturday night, just up until, you know, like midnight. And then their responses um, to appear should be due up until about midnight the next day. Um, there's pros and cons to that too. There's some faculty who, who have, uh, who don't like the idea of giving students work over the weekend like that. And I'm thinking sometimes that's the best time for them to do it you know, it's, it's up in the air. I don't think there's really any formula that says um, you should have this many per term or, or anything like that. Um, but I do think that the discussions are really vital. I mean, if I were to take that concept of discussions and go back to my face-to-face, -face, in my face-to-face -face courses, there's always a discussion component. Every class meeting, there was a discussion component. They worked either in small groups or I would have them um, do I think pair share or it was a simple um, five minutes think write down your thoughts and then we're going to discuss um, or we're going to do a chalk talk some some students don't do well in talking in front of others that's fine but they'll get up out of their seat and go to the board and write something you know so there was always a discussion component um, so I don't know if there's I, I don't know if there is a number that's too many um, that's, that's a good question though. And I think it's gonna be really, again, back to what it is you're wanting students to do. Um, so that's, that's at least my, my thought process on that. Um, and I don't know if there are any questions, any other questions or any other 
concerns, but this is an opportunity. I mean, we've got some time if you want to unmute or continue using the chat, it, it's whichever, whatever you need me to do to help you. But that's, I think that's basically it. Let me make sure. Yeah, this was my um, contact information in case you ever need to consult me about anything, but um, that's kind of what, what I do in my courses. Dr. Schoenberger, I had a um, question or comment as well. So I've been in courses where that I've taken as opposed to taught and they used um, discussion boards every single module, but I found in some instances, I found that all it was is we were providing our own feedback or feelings or whatever, rather than receiving any kind of information. And that's, um, I found that frustrating because I was there to learn, not just to teach. Um, similarly, I've been in a course that I didn't create and I taught and there were discussion boards every single week and I found it tedious and I know the students did too, as opposed to using a, in addition to or instead of other types of learning strategies. I understand. I, I, see, I see the context of the question now. And I do think variance is key. Um, so, and even though it's, it's discussion, I think even in the discussions, you can vary the approaches you do. Um, I'm trying to remember, this is my graduate course. I'm gonna talk while I'm trying to see if I can find it in which module it is. But I do vary that in that I make sure that first of all, students, I use the discussion boards to make it an opportunity that first of all, they have to connect to the material somehow. So in their discussions, in their comments, they, I have to make sure that, that they're putting together some, some intelligent responses and the way to do that, how does it connect back to the chapter readings? How does it connect back to my online lectures? Um, and I give them some freedom as well. You know, what, what are those things that you had that per personal connection to? What was the one thing that spoke out to you? And then I might, and then what I have done in this course, as well as my sports media, they had to go out and find something else and then share it, you know? So I think it just depends on how you might use that discussion board. It, it could be just where you have everything curated, you know, whatever that prompt might be. Um, to give you another, I, I think an example, in the course I'm taking, interpersonal communication in instruction, we have to do a um, interpersonal construct paper, four to five pages, but, and we are gonna share the paper with her, but with each other, we have to do a five minute video, and then we'll have to comment that way. Um, so I think it's just the way you vary, you know, discussion approaches. Um, I do think in my graduate courses, I want them to write more because obviously that's where we're, you know, they're progressing possibly into um, maybe doctoral work or even if they don't, they, they have to do a lot of writing, at least in my field. Um, undergrad, I, that's where I think the variance is really crucial. Um, they, they're digital natives, yes, but um, they, they do respond well when they're able to get, be given some freedom into how they might respond. But it's all, again, just make sure that's transparent to them. That's, that's my only concern. I always like, I, I never want a student lost in my course in any way. I wanna make everything, everything step by step. Um, let's see, yes, writing good prompts and discussion assignments is challenging, it is. Beginning with a good prompt that keeps discussion going takes some thought and it does, it really does. Um, and, Sometimes I have great opportunity. I'm like, oh, this will be a great discussion. But what are my module learning objectives? Again, what is it I'm wanting students to do? And there might be some modules, there might be some weeks where it's not going to be discussion. Um, they're, they're, they need to apply it in different ways. So it just depends on what it is you're wanting students to do. I'm going to do a stop share so that way I can see everybody. But I hope that this was helpful um, for you. Um, I, I learned a lot from 
uh, from all of you and your discussions and, and, and all of this in the chat. So this, I'm, you know, we're all in the same boat. So that's a good thing, you know? And I think what works for me is not going to work for you. Just like you, you, you'll have something that you'll come up with. And I, I think it's great, but it's not going to work for me. And that's okay. That's, that's okay. I think that's the beauty of this, but just know you have different strategies and you have different ideas um, to, to really make discussions fun for you and your students. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming, Melanie, to spend this time with us. And I'm sure she's open to, if you have questions or other um, thoughts that come up later and you want to send her a note, that would be, I'll, I'll volunteer her for that. And say, <laughs> she yeah, would, no, yes, please. Because yeah. um, she's great to work with. And I really do appreciate what you've shared with us today. I'm, I've made my little, I'm notorious for taking my little post-its and making my notes all around my um, laptop while I'm listening. And so I have some ideas too that I want to, um, take back and um, try and experiment with. So Excellent. I really do appreciate it. We, um, our next round of classes start at 1230. So that's why I know several people may have had to, um, to leave as they get ready for the next um, session of classes. But I do want to thank you, Melanie, and thank you for everybody who was here. And the recording will be posted to our um, CTL site and I'll be sending it out. So you can come back and look again at things if um, there's something that you wanna come back and refresh on. Okay, great. Thank you guys. It was good to see all of you today. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you. I appreciate you, Chris. I'll be talking to you soon. <laughs>